Um, Wanda, I, I, I've been doing these talks for a lot. Um, it might be you. I, I have my, my phone on about 55, so I'm pretty good. So hopefully you, um, it might be your connection. Even when you were on there, you were, you were not solidly on there. So I can't answer that. Oh, yep. Joe says he can hear well. So I don't know it's it's on my end. Sorry, Wanda, maybe, um, maybe turn yours up or make sure your plugins are all good for the speakers. All right. Well, I have 1.30, so I'm gonna welcome you and we're gonna get going and people can come and sign in again. But again, if you look at this first screen, you'll see um, another person said they can hear well, Wanda. So hopefully you uh, can figure out how you can make it hear, hear better. All right, so the first screen you can see uh, the link for the handout. So if you wanna go to that, copy that link down, you'll find it again, I'll repeat it again towards the end of the session so you can have a little chance to write it down. But there's a corresponding handout that goes along this workshop. Hopefully you've seen it with Z-Link as this link was when you got the invitation to join this meeting as well. But I encourage you to pick, print that out because it covers the whole state, everything I talk about. I'm gonna talk regionally about the Wilmer area, but you can sure talk about the whole state somewhere on the handout. All right. So I'm David Bao. This is like my over 30 workshops I've been doing this for the winter. Um, the traveling roadshow, but now I'm doing the rest of them on Zoom now. I was in Wilmer on Monday in person, but now I'm just doing Zoom meetings. So you're welcome to, uh, this will be recorded um, on our ABM YouTube site. So you'll you'll get that two prize invite to that. So again, we'll, we'll, we'll have you be able to send that workshop to you as well recorded. It's also um, the handouts there. So there's a lot of ways to get the information for later on. I get at least three questions today about rent. I've already answered several questions today. So if you have a question or I don't answer all your questions today, you can send me an email at my email address listed here or my cell phone number listed here. So you can send either one of those. Those are also in the front cover of the handout. Okay. So I'd like everybody to take a piece of paper out because I want to ask you a few questions. For some of you, it might be nap time. You know, I got to keep you awake for the session this afternoon. So take a piece of paper out and a pencil. And the first question I have for you that I want you to answer, you're not sharing with anybody, just yourself. But for 2023, for your land, what do you think is a fair rent for next year? Just write the number down. Don't, you're not sharing with anybody else. It's your number. But we're going to stay focused on rental rates. I'm going to show you lots of numbers, lots of uh, worksheets, examples. So I want you to think about what you think is a fair rent for next year. Just write that down on a piece of paper. All right, I have an agenda, but again, you can please put your comments in the chat box and I'll answer as we go. Um, I'll talk for about an hour and a half and then subject to questions and you can see I'll stay at the end for a while for questions. I'm gonna talk about land, re land rental data. Um, you've got a couple of sources of data I'm gonna share with you. You can find the trends in land rents. I'm gonna talk about corn and soybeans. I know Candy Oye County has got sugar beets and it does have, I think a $12 difference between corn ground and uh, so sugar beets last in 2021 data, but I know the sugar beet plant in Renville's having some issues. So that premium has disappeared quite a bit. And corn, soybeans, we're gonna travel the rest of Southern Minnesota. Those two crops are the main ones planted. And those two price rates slide later on how close the prices of corn and soybeans correlate to rental rates in Southern Minnesota. I'm gonna talk about numbers and I'm gonna use FinBin data. FinBin is a website you can all look at too. Farmers who participate in the adult farm management program in Minsky, Minnesota State College and University, an extension program, we do the records, put the numbers in that database. So I'm gonna talk about a region in Southern Minnesota with 1,200 farms. My press started in 1974 working for this extension and has numbers for these 1,200 farms. And I've kept track of them going forward to present. They're not the same 1,200 farms every year because some people retire, some people come in, but there's always roughly 1,200 farms every year I'm going to show the averages. But if you want to look at Candy Hoy County and compare those averages I'm showing you for Southern Minnesota, you're welcome to do that. I also have three sources of data for land rent values in here. And so I encourage you to we'll talk about where you can find those. In the packet and online, our extension website, there's a landlord worksheet for the landlord to fill out what they think is a fair return on their investment on their land. Another worksheet for the farmer tenant to fill out what they think they can afford to pay for rent. And a third worksheet is called an acceptable price worksheet. And I have four marketing groups. So I meet with monthly farmer marketing groups and they will fill us out. Um, okay, I'm Sibley County, you're great. Uh, that's just fine. You'll be able to talk on the handout. I just, I'm gonna talk about regionally. It might be on the region too. We'll just show you with the numbers, but we'll I'm gonna show you in a certain area around Wilmer, Candy Lake County. So I'll show you, we'll see if the city's on there or not. 
but you'll be able to hand out to see every county. Okay, you know, understand what we're talking about, just how you can proceed. So, except the price worksheet I do in the in this these marketing groups I'll do in January, and February, and we get to a bottom price after paying their costs, and that's the price they sell their crops for in a normal year to pay their bills. I'm going to talk about incorporating flexible rents. I've been doing these talks for 20 years or more. When I started doing them, we were less than 10% flexible rents. Today, we're probably 25%. And that's after uh, crop share leases were flexible rents, but they disappeared 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, five years in a row. These 1,200 farms in Minnesota on cash rented corn ground lost money. So on, on a crop share lease, as a landlord, I pay part of the input costs and I share the reward with the farmer. Well, if the farmer's losing money, it makes my, my income less than the rental income would be. So we'll talk about that too. I'm going to tell you um, cash rent still the lead out there on lease agreements and with cash payments up front and one payment is also the majority, but uh, they're still spring and fall payments. We'll talk about negotiation benefits of both parties. All right, back here. So our first website, if you print the handout out, the last page has all these websites listed on it, but this is our extension website where the Ag Business Management Team puts our information You'll find a statewide map on this website if, after you get to the Managing a Farm and you click on it and you'll see all the counties in the state of Minnesota. You can pick on any county you want. And for sure, it'll show you a USDA number and then also the FinBin numbers. They're side by side currently. And you can also put on a button by there. It says spreadsheet. And then that'll show you the historical data. So there's two places to look and that's a great website. You will also find a lot of the information that I talked about in the handout are on this website. A lot of slides I'm going to show you there are on this website. So it's a good place to go. So it's really easy to find, again, so I encourage you to put that handout down the road. I also have three bosses on campus. I'm actually on campus right now. It's a medium. I'm double booked right now. So um, once a year, usually in July, we come out with the rental rates for the state of Minnesota um, from the Finman data by county. You see that it used to come out in July. And this has an August date on it because in August, we update with the USDA numbers. They come out usually in late August, early September. This year they came out in August. So I updated this the document that we did in July with in August with the, the USDA numbers for 2022. Um, I also put on their, my boss's website instead of extension because the university has gone away from PDF files and I'm full of numbers and pages and the university wants us everything booked on the cell phone now. So they've gone away from PDFs. But if you wanna see a four page document on rents, you can click this website and you can go into publication, you'll find it. You have two pages in the handout if you do print the handout out of those four pages. And then on page two of that handout, you'll see these numbers. So you see Sibley is on this page. So if this is the region we're in central Minnesota. What this shows you are the average rents from the adult farm management programs from 2017, 18, 19, and 20, and the average of 21. So in Candy Ohio County, it was 229 in 17, 212 and 18, 211 and 19, and 215 and 20. And then it increased by $2 for an average of 217. These numbers come from the farmers to participate in the Adult Farm Management Program in the Candy Hoy County. For 21, there are four data points listed. First one is the average. The second one, 218 is the median. So all the rents listed in the county on the, from these records, the, the very middle rent was 218. Then it says 10th percentile and 90th percentile. The 10th percentile was the bottom 10% average, and that average is 157 in 2021. So that's the average. The rents lower and higher than that, but the average of the bottom 10% was 157. The ninth percentile is the area of the top 10%. So that says 259. So I know the rent's higher than that. There's rent's lower than that, but that was the average of the top 10%. The next column says 2022. NAS stands for National Ag Statistics Service. So they started publishing rents, I think, in 2011. They skipped a couple of years, but they come out usually late, late August, early September. And this by survey, they're saying 2022 rents in Candy Ohio County average 218. So I've got 217 from FinBin. Or 200, 2021, and then from a survey from USDA, they're saying it's 218 in 2022. Pretty close, but there's a lot of variation between counties. Look at Renville was 215 in Finbin and only, and then 247 from the USDA. So there's some variations there, but they're two different years as well. And there's a place to rewrite that number you wrote down on page one of your we're talking about. Also in the handout, we're now we were listening, we're talking about central Minnesota. So we look at the regional, the whole for the last um five years. The rates went up only 1.3% over that five year period because they were losing money in there. They went down in the middle, but they've come back up. And last year they went up 1.7%. And statewide, statewide number went up 2% for, for FinBin. So I'll, I'm going to use that for a first trend for rental rates that I'll show later on. 
Next question I'd like you to write down on your hand on a piece of paper is, what do you think it costs to produce one acre of corn and one acre of soybeans in 2022, this last year? It's a big number. This is a big range of numbers. So I bet whatever number you write down, you'll be in that range. But just what do you think? Including your rent and all the input costs, what do you think it costs the farmers to plant one acre of corn and one acre of soybeans in 2022? There's no wrong answer. Okay. All right. Next, I'm going to talk about a corn budget. Again, all these numbers for these 1,200 farms in Southern Minnesota. I'm talking about their averages since the 70s, but I'm going to look at 10 year averages or the last 10 years, those averages. You can go to the website and look at Candy County numbers too and compare to what I'm going to share with you now. So we got lots of snow in Minnesota, but this is Buffalo, New York. That's their seven feet of snow they got in one storm. I looked at this slide two weeks later. It was all green grass. We've got a lot of snow in Minnesota. Wouldn't it be nice if our snow melted in two weeks? But since then, they've got another uh, 50, 56 inches, I think, in one storm. So uh, they get a lot of snow in, in Buffalo, New York. So now we're going to talk about a corn budget. In the handouts, page four, I got four slides for one page. And we're going to look at these columns by the, each row are unique. The first row is yield. So these are all averages for the 1,200 farms in southern Minnesota. The first uh, thing is the range in values for the last 10 years. And again, so average number. The first column is the maximum value in each row. And the second column is the minimum value in each row. So the highest average yield for the last 10 years was about 211 bushel corn for these 1,200 farms. Lowest was 163. Okay. The 10-year average from 2012 to 2021 was 189. Next column is 2021 actuals is about 200 bushels, just under 200 bushels, 199.78. They didn't see a trend count for 22 and a trend count for 23. How they work is they take the 2021 actuals and add track the 10 year trend. Could be a plus or minus. Well, on yield, on yield there's about two bushel a year increase in yield. So you got 200 bushels in 21. You add two bushels to get 2000 or $202 or bushels in 22. They need to add two more bushels for 23, you get 204. The only column that works vertically up and down is forecast 23. That's my budget. I think it's going to be a typical budget for 2023. I have 200 bushels in there. I'm going to show you the five-year average for most counties in Minnesota do not get 200 bushel corn. That's relative, relatively a good yield um, for, for production here in this budget. The next line, going back to column headings, is the value of bushel. One year, the farmers averaged 650 for their corn. Another year, last 10, they only got $3.22. But their 10 year average corn price was $4.16, and they got a good price in 21 of an average of $5.39. 2012 was a good price year, so a $6 average. So we actually had higher prices in 2012 than we had in 21, so the trend's going down in price. I have a forecasted price of $5.50. I think I did this workshop back in September. In September, our corn price for 23 was cash, board contracted was $6, and soybeans are $13. So I took 50 cents off both those prices because farmers don't sell their crop at one point in time anyway, and use 550 and 1250. And I'll show you local prices shortly. Next line is total value for the product per acre. If you take the price times expected yield, you get $1,100. So that's almost the record for the last 10 years. Miscellaneous income, majority of this big number is crop insurance. Farmers can get yield insurance or revenue product, price times yield insurance. Well, I've got my normal yield up here and I got good prices. so. I'm not going to get a crop insurance payment based on $1,100. So that's my, number, my income projection. We keep going down the page. We have or the budget page. It's also online. It's called the directed costs. So these were directed to an acre of corn, one acre of corn. These are the costs by row again. The highest seed cost in the last 10 years averaged 127. The low was 106. The 10 year average was 115. The actuals are only 108 in 21. The trend's down. Farmers lost money those 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, those five years, they were looking for ways to control costs. So they actually lowered their seed costs. Because normally seed costs go up because they buy the latest and greatest uh, stack treatments, uh, seed coatings, um, hybrids, but they were trying to save costs. They planted conventional, not all the greatest hybrids. So, but now we have good prices and high expenses. So they're going to want to have a high seed price again because they want to put the best hybrids they can out there to cover their costs. The next line is fertilizer. You see the high was in the last 10 years, 188. The low was 114. 10-year average is 144. The actuals in 21 were 139. 
The trend's lower. But now I have 275 in there, big jump over 21 numbers. Last year, I used 190 for this past year, and now I've dropped it up to 275. I also have a bean credit on the bean budget. I have a fertilizer credit from the corn ground. So really, I'm putting about $300 in here in fertilizer. I know some farmers have planned $350 already for fertilizer costs. A lot of my market farmers had to buy their fertilizer last fall and pay for it, and this number would cover their costs. But, but if you buy it now, it'd probably be more expensive. The other costs on here, I've covered the trend, basically. You look at the trends, and I've just kind of covered them for these other costs. And then we're here to talk about rent. The high rent the last 10 years is 243. Low is about 200. The 10-year average is 220. It was lower than that in 21, but the, the cost expense of rent is going up about $2 per, eight per year. Last year, I was 245 in here, and I'm still well above the, the actuals, but I increased $10 because of the trends. One trend says 2% increase from Finbin. The other trend says a 4.5 cent increase from the USDA statewide. So I used 255 for an example. Normally, that's the second, the highest number on this line, but if that's the truth, what's the fertilizer going to be the highest expense next year? We'll find out. Rent could be higher too. Other costs are to cover the trends. So I'm at $869 for one acre corn next year projected compared to 100, 670 in 21. So about $200 an acre increase in input costs in two years on corn. The good news, we're still making $231 over those direct costs. And in 21, they made $426 on average, those 1,200 farms. Uh, we keep on next section is overhead expenses. So a farmer has corn, soybeans, sugar beets, small grains, alfalfa, and livestock, and they allocate their costs across all enterprises. And you see in 21 actuals, $106 was all those other costs. And that trend's a little higher, but I've just got $106 an acre in there for two years later. So now that's my overhead cost. Add that to my direct costs, I'm at $975 an acre to produce one acre of corn next year. That's a lot of money. You could almost say $1,000 probably for a lot of people. But the good news is they're still making money, $125 an acre, and they made good money in 21, average of $320 an acre in 21 actuals. At the bottom of the budget page, you'll see labor charge and $50 usually covers it. They've been getting a little more than that because they've been better revenue the last couple of years. But if you look at the 10-year average, they made $52 labor and $13 above that. So really they made about $65 an acre on corn ground over the last 10 years compared to $220 rent over the last 10 years. Government payments, uh, they only got 78 cents an acre on both corn and beans in 21, very minimal, trends down. And I do, with our prices the way they are and our good normal yields, I don't expect any government payments. So we're still making $125 an acre on corn ground, and that compares to the big number in 2021. These four numbers here, the 435 and the 513, those are important to farmers and the marketing groups. First one takes my total direct cost per acre, which I think was $869, divided by my yield of 200 bushels, and I need $4.35 on those 200 bushels to pay those direct costs. Next line takes my direct and over expenses, which is $975 in that budget above um, slide before. Divide by 200 bushels, I need $4.88. If I had $50 labor charge, I need $5.13 because I'm not expecting any government payments. That's my number. You see, that's the highest number in that line. The good news, this is the third year in a row since I've been doing these budgets. But last prior seven years, it was negative. But right now, for the last three years now, the price is above that price right now. For 2023 corn is above that. I'll show you local prices a little bit later. Now I'm going to talk about 2013 soybean budget. So again, the same column, the same headings. We've got uh, the good yields on beans in 21 like we had in corn. Trends higher a little bit, but I have 55 bushels in here for the five-year average again, which it covers most counties. Um, I have a price. The average price was 1377 one year. One year, they always had $8.60. And there was a year and a half where we never got to $9 cash beans. I'll show that a bit later. Again, the price is $12.50, so that's my income. It's a good number, but a little less than the corn compared to the records. No government payments, again, no crop insurance. So that's my income. Direct cost, just like corn, show you the different costs. I've doubled the fertilizer cost too, because fertilizer is going so much up on, on, on beans as well. So you see a little different costs. So my total direct cost with rent at 255 is $527 an acre for one acre of beans. That compares to this in 2021, which is about a $75 an acre increase. The good news is we're making money in 23 yet, and we're making good money in 21 on actuals. Overhead costs just like corn are not as much as corn. 
So I've covered the trends. I'm $71 an acre. Added it to my direct costs, I'm at $598 per acre for one acre of beans and 23. So about $1,000 on corn and $600 on soybeans. The good news is both those numbers are making money on corn and beans, and we made good money in 21, actually, on corn and beans. I got a question in chat. I'm going to check quick here. Um, Liz is saying she doesn't have a handout. Um, I, I'm not going to email it to you, Liz, right now, but I can later on. But there's a link. I'll show you the link um, in the first slide. I, I don't have where I can copy it right now, but I'll get you, you'll have a chance to see the handout later. Okay, I'll get to you at the end. Okay. So um, back to the slide here. We're making money. All right. And if I, I'll make sure I post that again for you. I'm going to get to the end and chart track. At the bottom of the page of the soybean budget, I don't, they don't charge much labor for beans, supposedly, as they do it for corn. They, they have $90 instead of $125 on corn projected. Their 10-year average is a little more on beans, about $92 an acre for income on, on the bean ground compared to $65 on corn for the last 10 years. These four numbers down here are very important on just like they were before. The direct cost, $527 divided by 55 bushels is $9.58. Next one is direct no grid cost, the $598 expenses divided by 55 bushels, you need $10.87. And I have my $50 labor charge at $11.60 and no government payments, it stays there. So almost the record number there, not like it was, not quite as high as it was on corn. <clears throat> so input costs are increasing. $200 in two years on corn, 70 plus on beans. Farmers margin are shrinking because 21 and 22 prices are pretty level. I'm gonna show you that a little bit later. But <clears throat> 23 prices compared to 22 prices are all lower. I'll show you those two later. 50 cents to a 75 to a dollar lower for 23. So that's going, to, even though their input costs are going up, the prices are going down, so their margin is shrinking. That's just inevitable. In the handout on page six, I have these prices for you. These are Worthington cash prices. It shows the high price during the year, the average for the year, and the low during the year. So, <clears throat> 10 year average, you got, if you pick the handout out, you'll see since 78. But what I'd like you to look at is we had four years, or th I'm sorry, four years for $12 beans, and we had three years for $6 corn. And so that's when we were making money. And then, fortunately, we started losing money because the corn price went from 604 average to 385. And for the next seven years, it stayed the $3 average. So, it took five years for the farmers to figure out how to adjust the $3 corn again after we had $6 corn. And so I had to adjust their input costs. Rents went down that time frame. And then what happened in 21, look what the price did in 21. It went from 337 average to 576. So now we have a big opportunity to increase rents again, increase their costs. So around that scale up again, like we were back in 11, 12, and 13, we had $6 corn, okay? And bean prices, we had those four years at $12 or above. We had several years at nine or eight dollars, and then we went to 13, 39, a big jump again in soybeans in 21 from 20. So that just shows you the impact of prices. I had an in-person workshop in, in Wilmer on Monday morning. And so I was, this is Ally Grain and prices on Monday. Cash price for January through March was $6.39, had a minus 15 cent basis. And the new crop bid was 546 with a 4,500 basis off the futures prices. So my 550 budget is actually higher than the numbers were on Monday in, in uh, Bloomcast. So <clears throat> um, I want to tell you that there's a lot of places right now with positive corn bases, and then there's places with narrower, and there's places with wider bases uh, for corn. So they vary around the states, but that's your current situation in the area. And here's a soybean market from Monday. They're paying 14.57 cash for beans with a 3,500 basis, and they're paying 13.32 for beans on Monday with 6,500 basis. And in my market group in Southern Minnesota, Southwest, I use 50 cents of corn and 60 under for beans normally. So like your corn price is better than that, and your bean base is worse than that. And the nearby basis is 35 under on both corn and beans. I have positive basis in Southwest Minnesota right now. We also find the highest bean prices usually in Mankato in the state, and the highest corn prices are usually found by an ethanol plant or by the river that's open. So how the 22 numbers look? I had to put the budget expenses down, but I will tell you there's really variable yields out there this year. I live in Murray County, have an office in Nobles County. And in Murray County, we're disaster county in 21. We haven't declared the 22 yet, but we have a worse year in 22. We were really drying from east to west, it got drier. 
and I had farmer come one of the marketing groups that hadn't been there for a couple of years. His corn, average in all those different fields, averaged 10 to 100 bushels per acre on corn, well below their average normals. But as I travel around the state, I've had farmers have 270 bushel corn in Minnesota too. That's a very big variance, 10 to 270. On beans, I've had some 20s to over 80. I've had people tell me I was the average use of 80 bushel of beans this year. So a lot of variables. In general, we had good prices throughout the year. It didn't roller coaster ride, but it's still good prices. So we talk about profits. I got some more examples for you here. I have a market group in Wabasso. It's just north of Highway 14, like 12 miles. And that group, I took 10% yield loss off of their yields because they were dry there too for the last two years. So a year ago into these budgets, my costs were $850 on corn and $551 on soybeans, all your labor costs. Take those lower yields by 10% times the price that they had in the slide for from 22 corn and beans. And I get $1,100 income on corn and $611 income on soybeans. Take those expenses against that income, I'm making $259 an acre, 50 cents on corn and $60 on soybeans. That averages about $160 an acre profit. That's a good number. We won't get any crop insurance payment with 10% year loss and we won't get any government payments expected. So my income is going to be average of 160. If I, I have a farmer in the same county where I had 10 bushel yield, I had another farmer 20 miles away in the northeastern part of the county, and he got 220 bushel corn, same county, 10 to 220, that's a big variance. And 65 bushel beans, I took those same yields and the same price and expenses, they would average a $436 an acre profit. So a lot of difference between those situations. So there's a lot of variance out there. So I would tell you, uh, it really is an interesting year. Government payments for 23, this is what they were in 21. I expect them to be the same or lower going forward in 23. So that's why I have zeros in my budgets. Again, all the numbers I share with you are those 1,200 farms, they're averages. So the Minnesota, you can look at Candy White County or Sibley County, wherever you want to look at, but, you, but if you want to, but I want to, show, want to show how much they vary. So the first thing you do is the Finley website is right here. You go to that green crop bar, corn on a cash on the ground account first, you pick your county you want to look at, and you can see the numbers. You can also click on that red crop bar, and you see a benchmark report. And that's the next page we're going to show you. And this is in the handout here, printed out. <clears throat> page seven, but this shows you a lot of information and it's small numbers. I'm sorry to share, but it's small, but so it's got several columns. The first column is one farm. So measurement report compares my farm numbers to my peers. In this example, it's the whole state, but in like extension, we have 112 farms in Southwest Minnesota. It would compare myself to 112 farms. But this case, I'm comparing myself to the whole state. This is not me, but my farm example. So the first column is my farm's numbers in each row. The second column is median. So in each row, they're unique, is the median value, the middle value in each row. So my farm yield was 209, 209. The median was 194. The third column is the count, 2,427. That's how many farms were raising corn on cash on the ground in 2021 in the Dolphin Management Program. So it's a good source of farms, numbers of farms. So it's good data. So then you see a 10%, 20% to 100%. Those represent 10% in every one of these columns of the row. So we take 2,427 farms and we put them in line, lowest yield to highest. And then we take the bottom 10%, the first 243 farms in that line, average their yields and they average 92 bushels and 92.5 bushels an acre. Next 243 farms in that line averaged about 170, 137 bushels. And the final 243 lines at the end of the line averaged about 238 bushels. So every one of those 10% groups average our 10% of the farms in that row. Next line is value per unit. Sample farm got 455 for his corn. The median was 550, so he didn't do a very good job marketing. Again, the same number of farms. So 10% of the farms, 243 farms, average $4.50. Next 10% average $5, and so on. Top group average $6. So dollar fifty difference top to bottom. You see all the cells are highlighted. If you ever print it off, they'll be great on your handout. That's where the sample farm numbers are in each row. So they're comparing themselves to the peers. Where do I fit? And as a farmer, I'd want to have my, in the top half, be 60 to 100%. My numbers be in those groups. So he's doing pretty good on yield. They're terrible on price, bottom 10%. Below half on the total revenue. He didn't have any hedging accounts. And only 77 farms had a gain or a loss. So again, 10% each one of these columns. So the first column, eight farms averaged $179 loss. Next column, eight farms averaged $117 loss. And at the end, eight farms made $40.62. That shows you the differences, okay? 
You see the next line is crop insurance. He got some crop insurance. They can buy higher coverages and you can also buy revenue insurance. He probably had some of both. He got a payment, but he had good yields. 518 farms got a crop insurance payment. So every one of these columns, 51, 52 farms. But in 2021, we had a windstorm come through Southwest Minnesota and our farms lost money. Some of them, or they lost yield eventually. They had one farm that thought he had 220% of corn before the wind came through and his corn just blew over flat and actually broke off from the wind. When it broke off, it stopped maturing. So he thought he had 220 bushel corn when he harvested, he had 119 bushels. And there was so much mold and mildew in the field that the cloud of dust was so bad he couldn't see the green cart from the combine. So he was really disappointed. He got crop insurance on the 119 bushel corn. Had another farmer in the northeast part of the county. He, harvested, he had a flat field showing pictures of his, but his didn't break off. It matured and he got 185 bushel corn. So again, it has a big impact, but people got the windstorm, probably got impacted here. And then people got hailstorms, also got impacted here. But again, not everybody got those. It just shows you 52 farms got $440 crop insurance. But those people that got that big payment did not get the 237 bushel yield. They probably are in the bottom 10%. So every yield, every row is unique. Same farmers, not all the way down here. And now we down here, see how the sample farm numbers are very, in each row vary all over the place. And that's what happens. Okay. So let's go down to uh, total cost. Expenses, they list the high expenses the lowest. So again, we want to be in the top half for lower cost. He's got a few more in the bottom half of expenses. His rents is in the bottom half. His seed costs the bottom half. You go to overhead costs, and then we get total cost per acre. Very interesting. 10% of the farms, 240 farms averaged in 21. $967 per acre on corn. The top 10% of the farms, 243 farms, average 513. About $250 an acre, or I'm sorry, $450 an acre difference. A big range in cost. Okay. Going on profitability, our sample farm made $223 an acre. acre. The median was $225, but the bottom 10% of the farms, 243 farms, averaged $101 an acre loss. Well, the top 243 farms made $562 an acre. $650, $670 difference, big difference, top to bottom. So when I talk averages, there's a lot of range out there, isn't there? The number that I'm really interested in is this, this bottom number. They take their total expenses, divided by their actual yields, and they get this price. What I need to sell my crops for to pay my bills. Our sample farm needed $3.48. The mean was $4.14. But 10% of the farms, 243 farms, needed $6, $5.99 to pay their bills. Next group being five fourteen, and the top group being only two dollars ninety one cents. When I look at two thousand twenty three compared to two thousand twenty one, which is showing here, I got a two hundred dollar an acre input input cost increase. So if I keep my two hundred bushel yield, that's a hundred dollars or a dollar an acre in price increase. So if I if the yields stay the same as they were in twenty one, this group would need seven dollars. This group would be six dollars and fourteen cents. This group needed five dollars and seventy three cents, and this group would need five forty eight. So we're we're about to break it even there. So thirty percent for sure of this money the way we've got set up right now for our budget. Here's a soybean budget. So I used to be a bank banker for nine years too in dairy country, and a lot of my dairy countries did not have cash crops like soybeans. So we lost a few farms on cash run, but bean ground. So now every ten percent of these columns represents roughly two hundred nineteen farms. So you see the variance in yield from 20 to 72, variance in price from 11 to 1364. You see our final farm had a good yield. He did better in pricing, but still in the bottom half. He's still in the top half for total revenue. As in zero, because he didn't have hedging counts to be there. You see all different things. So we come down to the bottom here and we see a total cost. One thing he's doing better on beans than he was on corn. He's only got one item in the bottom half and that's rent cost. The total cost breaker, 10% spent 660 and 10% spent 305. Half the cost between top and bottom. Look at total profits. Our sample farm made good money. The median was a lot less. The bottom 20% lost money on average, but there was a $81 an acre loss average to a 393 profit on top 10%. So a big variation there, top to bottom. And then the price variation is 1491 to just about 760 or some sorry, 659. For these, I'd add about dollar costs. So that'd be 15, 91, 12, 28, and we're about, or 13, 28 would be that number. So only a lot less would make, would lose money on corn, beans on this bummers than corn. So input cost trends, um, 
do you think they're going to be next year? Are they going to go down? Are they going to stay the same? Are they going to go up? Well, in general, I could say some of all, but really the only thing I can keep the same is drying fuel because for if the moisture is wet and corn, they dry it down the fall. And then we put $20 in there for an average. This year we had dry corn out of the field at harvest time, so we didn't have much drying costs. But some of you just $90 an acre. But that's about the only thing I can think to stay the same. Most of them are going up this year. All right. One of the biggest factors of profitability for the farmers? Well, the first one is controlling their cost. And normally the biggest cost is rent. It's 30% of gross on corn and 40% of gross for soybeans. We're going to show you those numbers, how they where they come from. Yields. Farmers don't want to control their costs where they lose some yields. So uh, they vary across the state. Like I said, I went from 10 to 270. Um, I went from 20 to, I've heard, 80 bushel beans as I travel around the state this year. And prices in 22 are very similar to 21. So let's show you 21 prices. Good price increase over 22, 20, 2020. But I told, I'll show you shortly how 23 prices are a little bit lower than 22. Input cost trends, they were high in 2012, and they were actually lower than that in 21. So they actually declined, but they had declined overall. So there's not an input cost trend, but they had gone down five years, but they increased very high during the years and had gone down. Whereas beans are still, were started at 402 and ended at 455. They'd increased 1.3% over the last 10 years. Okay. I have a sample budget here for Southern Minnesota. I have the yields we're talking about, the price that we're talking about, expenses I showed you on those budgets. I have $50 for the labor for the farmer. And this is my total cost breaker for corn, total cost breaker on beans, $845 and $393. Take that away from my income. I'm left with $328 an acre for corn and $295 an acre for soybeans. If you print this off in the handout, it'll say the average of those two numbers combined 50 50 rotation of half corn, half soybeans. It averages out to $312 an acre rent for next year. So I'm going to show you some slides later on where you take the net income off the land. And normally for the last 15 and 20 years or 15 and 10 years, the farmer's been getting about a third of the income profit off the land, and the landlord's getting about two-thirds. So in this example, you got $50 going to the farmer, the landlord's getting $312. So total income is $362. Is that one third, two-thirds? It's just something to think about. Uh, if printed off, you also see the bottom line on the handout shows you if the price of the corn went down 50 cents and the price of beans went down 50 cents, that $312 an acre rent would go down to 247.50. So the price has a big input impact on these budgets. This just shows you since 2007-2021, the squares are the cost per bushel for corn for the 1,200 farms. The X's are the price they got for the corn. So when the price is above the cost, they're making money. But here's that long spell where they lost money. And they made money the last two years. And then beans, here's their cost in diamonds. Their, their price they sold for in triangles. And they only lost one year and maybe two years there a little bit in the last several years. On the handout, you'll see some websites. The USDA has a website where they publish these rents once a year by county. So we're in Candy Hoy County right now. You'll see the first count was 21, the second count was 22 for cropland. It went from $213 and 21 to $218 an acre and 22. That's the trend from the USDA survey. You see some tick marks. They didn't publish them for, for pasture rent. So if you wanted trends in pasture rent, they went up a dollar, Minnesota statewide. And for cropland, they went from 177 to 185. That's a four and a half percent increase and a dollar increase in pasture ground. And you can find this online if you want to see the document. You just go to that website. It's called nas.usda.gov. Uh, and it's that simple. You pick Minnesota and go under publications. Land values. What are the trends for land values? Are they going up? Are they going down? Or remain the same? Most of the time, you know, people tell me they're going up. And they probably are. And they went up a lot in 22. So we'll see what they're doing right now. But um, I have, have had a few people tell me they're staying the same or going down a little bit. The USDA also publishes once a year a number for Minnesota. For the land values and pasture land values. So... The highs for 2018 was these highs for, for cropland was 49.50, for pasture was 17.50. That was the old high. It went down the next two years and started a new high in 21. And then in 22, it increased even more. So they're saying the average was $6,200 an acre for cropland and $2,010 an acre for, for pasture ground. Iowa said there was about 20% increase. And so if you take 20% here, it's about right. Here's the pasture ground trend, $1. Here's the cropland non-irrigated was at 4.5%. Had pasture ground, it went in, increased $13. And you see that still below the high back in 19 for, for irrigated ground average. 
So how do you determine a fair, what is a fair mint? He wrote a number down on page or the first question early on. How's that number still filled? I've got more worksheets and more numbers to share to see if you feel comfortable yet. The first worksheet you can find on our website is on page 10 in the handout as well. It's for the landlord to fill out. And I have examples in the margins and I have blanks for the landlord to put their numbers in. So the first one is farm site. You put your tillable acres in there. In South of Minnesota, we've tiled everything, pull up the fence lines. So that's the most you can tillable. The rest is road ditching right away. So that's my tillable acres. Next line is value per acre. This is your worksheet. I thought that was going to be this, the average sale price for bare land in Southern Minnesota this year. It turned out to be a little higher than that, but you can put what it's assessed for because they're pretty close to those values. Actually, they're, they're selling for a little bit above the assessed values right now. Um, you can put what you paid for it. You can put what you, if you sold today, would you walk away and invest somewhere else? It's your worksheet. At $8,000 per acre, at $150, 56 acres, you get 1.28 million for 248. Next one is another variable. I use two and a half percent. My dad did ag real estate loans for over 40 years. And we used to use 4%, then we went to three and a half, then we went to three. I've been at two and a half percent for a lot of years now, maybe five. Iowa State's been at 1% for at least seven, eight years now because there's only so much income to be generated off the land. No matter what the land prices do, they do fluctuate a little bit. So what's the rate of return you get from your land? As the price went so high, that percent went down. And the opportunity against that were really low. The banks are paying point something on your money. The stock market wasn't doing very good until two years ago. And now last year it went down again. So what do you use? At 2.5%, it's $31,200. At 1%, it'd be $12,480. It's your worksheet. You put whatever you want in there. Next line is real estate taxes. I have an office in Warrington, Minnesota. And it's $60, I got a misprint there, but $60 is over here per acre. At, that'll cover most non-homestead farmland in Nobles County. I, that put number in, whatever taxes are. Have a little bit of liability insurance. Always bring this up, because we sue for everything. So if somebody gets hurt in your land, even if it's bare dirt, they can sue you. So I always tell you to take your legal description to your homeowner's policy and see if they'll add it to it. Sometimes they'll do it free of charge and you have the protection of your homeowner's policy extend to your land. If you have a farm, make sure it includes the whole description of the farm because they still get sued for everything. You might have some other costs. Um, I get those, I get three questions a year round. And some members tell me, well, they, they have a machine shed, there's some green bins, there's a dryer, there's some livestock, so they can use whatever they want. Well, if there's a water, electricity, heat, the, the farmer should be paying those costs. My family had a farm where the tire line went down below the drainage ditch. So we had a retaining pond and we had a pump in there to pump the water from the pond into the drain drainage ditch. So whatever your costs are, add them up and divide by your total acres. You've got $261 an example. Have another example. I'm, I'm using this from uh, Douglas County up by Alexandria. They have less tillable acres. The $3,500 could be the value for that or also be what you paid for it 10 years ago. Um, you've got that lower value then because of that and lower number here to invest on it hopefully lower taxes if this is really the assessed value. You have liability insurance, you paid for it. And now you take that number divided by your total acres and it's a lot less, isn't it? So I do this worksheet and I get this number, 115, I get $200 an acre rent, I feel really good. But I do this worksheet and I get 261 and I still get off at of $200 and I don't feel so good, do I? This is a way for you to figure out what you think is a fair rent for yourself before you even get the negotiations, okay? There's also a worksheet in the packet and online, our extension website for the farmer tenant to fill out. I got several slides on the one page document. Again, I hear I got a 200 acre parcel. I'm going to rent from the landlord. I'm going to plant half corn and half soybeans, 100 acres of each. I have no government payments, so I've got zeros in there. I have the yields and price I've been talking about. I have the expenses I've been talking about. Again, I have $50 labor for the farmer. And corn, my cost up to $770 per acre and beans, $397. That leaves $330 for corn and $291 for beans. I have 100 acres of each of those crops. So you take 100 times 330 and you get 33,000. 100 acres of beans, 291 times 100 acres is 29,100. I'm not expecting any government payments or any other income. So my total revenue is 62,100. So we divide that out. My right, 200 acres, I need 310.50 gives my rental rate. So again, both set 312. But what's the farmer getting? $50 an acre again. Here were the markets. When I was in Wilmer on Monday, this is the futures markets. 
So again, here's the, the nearby markets were in March, but you can sell corn way up December 26. The futures price is $4.92. Our basis in 23 was 45 cents. So even taking that off of here, it'd be below 450. Okay, so we got to think about um, that's going to be a probably an unprofitable price if our input costs stay the same as they are in 23 right now. Same thing for soybeans. You got a good prices right now, 1470, but going out 26, the price is 1225. We had a 65 cent basis. So now we're at 1140 potentially out there for 26 prices, and that's below our break even price of 1160 okay, today. Here was December corn. It's not out there anymore. This is a weekly chart. I put it up here because this is the first week of December. This tick marks where we started. We started below 550. The third week of May, we got to a high above 760. So we went up two dollars and over two dollars and ten cents or twenty cents even. Then we went back to 560 down here. Remember in the 670 range when it ended. So it's a really yo-yo ride, isn't it? So where do you sell your crops? They are making money. So they, our market group's average is about five dollars and eighty-five cents, eighty-six cents, and they didn't catch this higher prices. But again, some farmers sold their crop for seven dollars. Here are these higher prices in the fall. One of my farmers. Share crops is mom's land, my marketing groups. She got 705 for her crop right out of the field. It was dry, no drying costs. And the farmer averaged less than that by $1.50 because he had sold some earlier. So again, every situation is the same. Now here's 23 compared to this. Oops. Um, well, here's 23. Nope, this is soybeans. Here's 23, December 23 corn. So here's where we start January 21st week. We start here just about $5. We started the other one at, at 550. We peaked out below 680. We were at 760 on 22 crop. And now we're below $6. And we ended up at like 670. So that's how much lower 23 prices have been than 22. Here's 20, 22 beans. We started at 1275. We went above 1575, went back to $13. And we're in the 670 range. Here's November 23 beans. We start at $12.75 lower. We peaked out at um, a little bit, of, probably about $14.50. We were at $12 or $15.75 on $22. And now we're at about $14. So that's a big difference. Okay. Next worksheet is called Acceptable Price Worksheet. It's in the handout, it's online. I got, I think, four slides for this as well. In the 112 farms south of Minnesota, Adult Farm Management Program, they averaged 962 acres of cropland. So an example here, I have 500 acres of corn and beans, a thousand acre farm, half of each crop. I have the bushels and yields I've been talking about in the prices, I have the input costs, I have rent at 255, I have the total cost breaker on corn at 975, and I round the beans up to $600. So I have 500 acres at 975 is this total cost for corn inputs. 500 acres at $600 is total cost for beans, 300,000. So almost $800,000 expenses for the corn and beans on a thousand acres. Middle of the page, I have 85,000 for family living costs, which includes their state and federal income tax, their self-employment tax, and the health, health costs, health, health insurance. 60% comes from row crops. The rest comes from off-farm income or livestock operations. So it's about $51 an acre for living costs. On the bottom of the worksheet, you see five acres of corn input costs, five acres of beans input costs, I have equal acres of corn and beans, so I have half living costs have no government payments expected. So I have to raise 513,000 on my corn ground and 325,500 dollars on my bean ground. My normal yield is 200 bushels on corn and 55 bushels on beans, 500 acres, 100,000 and 27,500 for beans. Divide those bushels into expenses and I need 513 on my corn and 1184 for my soybeans. And again, our prices for 2023, corn and beans are above those. So the good news, we can make money. But if I was doing this in my work groups, I'll lose my market groups in January, February. We'll go to this worksheet for average of the group costs. And if we, those will be our target prices. We can sell our crop for above those prices. And we get our normal yields and make money. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about land rental rate trends. I've got a couple sources of data for you here. So um, the USDA started publishing rents back in 2011. And here's the trends. So um, they started losing money back, remember I told you, in 14. So rents started going down. Two points all those years, they were zero one year. Then they went up in 19 to 20. They were zero in 2021, and they went four and a half percent in 21 to 22. So that's the increase from 177 to 185. 
That's the second trend I've shared. Finman was 2%. The USDA was 4.5%. Okay, the irrigated ground, it went from 187 in 21 to $200 in 22. And pasture ground went from 26 to 27. Those are the statewide numbers from the USDA uh, Ag Statistics Service. This just shows you those statewide numbers of the trend. It seems like almost some pasture ground was going up. Cropland was going down. So this is on the handout, but this combines two sources of data side by side. So 15, 16, 17 through 21, that's from FinBin. That's from the adult farm management records put into a database called FinBin. So it's the average rents by those farmers off the records. So 212, 220, to 229, to 212, 211, 215, back to 217. So it went down a few years, and they're losing money. And then it went up again, okay? The bold numbers for 19, 20, and 21, those are from the USDA. So these are from the farmer's records, and these are from a survey done by the USDA. So they're saying 19 was 196, compared to the FinBin was um, 211. They're saying 20, it was uh, 219 compared to 215. And 21, they're saying 213 compared to 217. So they're pretty close. And then they come out with a survey in August that said it was 218 for Candy Hoy County. This is the only place you find estimates. I don't have this on, I have all these numbers online too, but I don't publish the estimates because that's just an estimate. I don't really want to have that out there saying these are the rental rates. It's just, I'm going to tell you what I did in the worksheet. So here I'm plotting the USDA trend of four and a half percent increase and the FinBin trend of 2% increase. So I take the latest rental data from 22 to 218 times 2% and you'll get $222 an acre for an average. Take the 218 times four and a half percent you'll get $228. That's those numbers are created. Now, it's just a guideline, just follow the trends that are out there from two sources of data. So again, we can talk more about that if you have questions later on. This slide I do every year, just kind of shows you, I don't have it anywhere online, even I just do it for myself, kind of show you how closely the corn and soybean prices correlate to land rents. So I see the years are from 2000 over here to 2021. You see the average price of corn and beans over here, the farmers received all those years. The next column takes the price of corn and bean changes from year to year. So even though corn penny beans are down enough, the average went down 3.21%. This middle column is the actual rents paid by those 1,200 farms. So I'll tell you, rents gradually go up in the good times. You see a steady, steady increase until peaked out at 243. Then they slowly go down as the prices are going down. They still kind of stay and now they went up in the year. So we had six, so we had six dollar corn for three years, and that's when it peaked out last year, six dollar corn. And after that, we took the three dollar average and it went down. And now this last year went up to five dollars and thirty nine cents and it popped up again ten dollars an acre. Okay, the next column is the one that applies the price of corn and bean price to the rental rates. It takes the previous year rent times the price change to get a forecasted rent. If the price of beans and corn were exactly correlated to the rents, these would be the same number, but they're not apples to apples. We're setting rents up in the fall and the prices are coming next year, the actual prices, okay? So they're not quite apples to apples, but they do follow trends. So the price went down, so the, the um, this went down from $98 to 95, but they're not the same. Next year, price went 15%, so the price took the actual rents times that price increase to get 212, so you're above the actual rents. Take the actual rents time the price change to 16%, you're way above. A big, another increase, you're way more above. Then we had 25% decline, you went way below. Then a 10% increase, you're above. 50% increase, you're way above. 47% increase, you're still above quite a bit. Then you had 23% decline, went below. Here you're still uh, above a little bit because you had seven, here you had a 40% increase, way above. Then you had a 2% increase, so less. And then you had losses for a few years, so you went down and these were, um, you're lower than the actual rents. And then we started going above. Look what happened in 21. The 278 might be the right number. I'm not saying it is, it's just which plotted by trend. After we increased $10 over here and the price change went up 27%. But why I say the corn and soybean prices really control the rents, if I take the 20 year average from 21, 2001 to 2021, compared to the forecasted rents by price change and average them out, so I take that average number of 20 years, how close think they are. They vary a lot because they're adjusting each year, but there's less $2 an acre difference over 20 years between the average rent on those two columns. That's really amazing how close they do get together. Column seven up here, the last column is your coffee shop rates, okay? So this one never goes back to reality. It starts here at the benchmark at $98.31, 
times the price change gets 95. Takes the rent times the price change because always takes the previous year rent, forecasted rent, times the price change. Never goes back to reality. So they're much higher numbers over here. The three years had $6 corn. We had three years about $300. Okay. Then it went down quite a bit under the actual rents, under forecasted rents on price change. But now where it's at again, it's way above. That could be the right rent too. But again, it kind of follows the coffee shop rates and it follows that direct price change of corn and beans. I'm going to talk a little bit about land values. I got two sources here. I actually have three sources in the talk. But the first thing I like to do on that piece of paper, you wrote your rent down. I'd like you to write down what's your average yield on your farm for the last five years, 21, 20, 19, 18, 17. What's been your corn and bean yields for the average of those last five years? What's your actual production history of your farm? Just write a number down. Okay, the reason I want you to write that down, this is on our extension website as well, but it's also in the handout. If I go to Candyway County, this is your corn yield to come from the USDA in February each year. Same yields we use for the farm bill. You see there's two numbers in bold here. You see in 2021, Candy Valley County was the only one that didn't put the rents out when they, or the yields out when they came out in February. There are county committees in each county and they would fill a number in for your local, but I just took the whole these counties, the other counties, times they changed from 20 to 21. And I figured that percentage change and apply it to 193 to get 224 forecast. Did the same thing from 18 to 19 and got 192. So I filled in the blanks. That's why they're in bold. Okay, so you take the five-year average is 201. So you look at all those counties, you see any 200 bushels there? Five-year average, none of them, except for Candy, Ohio County is the only one at 201. You see the regional average? 177. So I use 200 bushels of corn, I'm using the good yield, aren't I, in my budgets? Go up to beans, the same two years, they didn't have bean numbers. I filled them in, so the average for the last five years is 46 bushels. There are none there at 55 bushels. Regional average is 46. So I want to just highlight that I'm using good yields in those budgets at 55 and 200, okay? How should your farm compare to these yields? If your farm yields are above or below these yields, that would tell you if maybe your land's above or below average. There are also two indexes out there that you could use. The CPI, Crop, Producti Crop, Crop Productivity Index, the CPI, that's a current index, and that replaced the CER, Crop Equivalency Rate, CPI and CER. So you could find out probably your CPI today, go to your, on your farm and ask the county assessor, what's the average for the county? Again, if your ratings are above or below the average for the county, then you know maybe if your land's above or below average for the county, and apply it to average rents. This is another document on our extension website that I showed you earlier on, extension website, you can go to our business section. I just got this done for 22. Um, so the new one will be on there in the next two weeks for sure on the website, but probably next week. But this shows you what Bear Dirt is selling for in 14 counties, Southwest Minnesota. I had a predecessor who started in the 80s doing this data on six counties, but seven. I started doing it in 2005 and I went to 14 counties, doubled it. And this is Bear Dirt. He had started with the sales in the first six months of the year, so I kept that trend. So it's Bear Dirt, no improvements, it's non related parties, no family member transactions. It's more than 20 acres, so I don't want building sites. It's uh, more than half till, but I want prop land. And I get the data for that stuff and it shows you the numbers here. So 11, 12, and 13, we had $6 corn. Normally I tell you these would change one or 2% a year. And look what the price of change, percentage changes those three years were. Almost 100% over those three years. And this is the high, $8,466 an acre average for these 14 counties. Then I showed that price changes, went down $3 average for those years. Look at how much went down. We had one year a little bump, but for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, those seven years we had $3 average, well, corn price or less, it went down. 21, we had a big jump in corn prices and it went up again. Those four highlighted counties went down though. And 22, it went up again a lot. So I, I have the numbers probably, but I'll tell you numbers. You know, 27.2% in 22. This average I thought would be 8,000. I used in the landlord worksheet. It actually was 8,700 and something. It went up about $900 an acre. Maybe six hundred something, but it was about nine hundred dollars an acre increase, or twenty seven point nine percent. And only one county went down, or actually two of them went down out of the fourteen in twenty two. So you can find that online, but it's on our extension website. This is how Black Dirt sells for. Okay, you can also go to this website on the handout. I have every county listed in alphabetical order. 
Uh, but you can go to this landeconomics.umn.edu website. It's a great place to go. I was just talking to Bill Lathers on the campus right now. He's doing this currently for 22. And they'll probably come out by March of this year. So this will be updated by then. But so right now you can go to that website. You can pick Candy Lake County. And you can find all three of these sales by township. This is a price, average sale price for Tillow Acre. The average in 21 was 6247 the average in 20 was 6337 so it tells you they went down a little bit. But again, it's only by what partial sell that year. So um, some went up, some went up, this went down, some went up, some went up, this went down, this went up, this went up, went up, went up, went up, down, up, and up. So a few went down, most of them went up. But if you want to find where those three sales are, you can find the cheapest one and the highest one by township, by going to that website and kicking the county, Taking the price sale prices for Tillow Acre. There's different ways you can sort it. You can see all those sales. It's very informative. You can all see all those sales by townships in 1990 if you want to go to that website. So I encourage you to do that at your free line, free time afterwards. But again, it's landeconomics.umn.edu is the website. Very informative. So I'm going to talk a little bit about rental rate trends. Again, I've got some sources of data here for you online and in the handout. Um, I have a two-page document on rental rates that talk about general gap generalities. So there's lots of ways to do it in flexible rental agreements. And I encourage you to pick one out and then do the details. So you can do one based on gross revenue. I see this quite often out there. It's a very common agreement. You can do one on base rent plus a bonus. You can do it based on yield only. You can do one based on price only, or you can do one based on profits. So this is part of that two-page document online. You can find this online. What this shows you, from 1997 to 2021, these last two columns are the average price the farmer received for their corn and beans, those 1,200 farms. I have two more columns I couldn't show on here, that the average yields. I take those average yields times those average prices, and I get the first corn gross and the bean gross, 321 and 272. That's the gross revenue off corn and beans that year, averages. The first column's the average rent was 1,200 farms, so $94 rent, almost 95. Take that rent divided by the gross and you get 3% on corn. Take the rent divided by the gross on beans, you get 35%. That's percent of gross. That's a very common lease out there. It's a flexible lease. So you go to the bottom of the spreadsheet and you see um, big numbers here as the price of corn and bean increased at 559 and 559 and the 1293. So big jump in gross revenue because it jumped so much and the rents went up, but not accordingly, the percent of gross went down. But the 10-year average, like I showed that one slide, is 3% of gross on corn and 40% of gross on beans. That can be, a, I get people calling me every year for those two numbers. I also want to highlight there's three years over here where corn's $5 or above for an average. And the percent of gross went down those years. So I'm going to show examples that way too. But I'll start with the 30 and 40%. It's going to be big numbers. So 200 bushel corn at 550 price, 30% rents 330 an acre. If the price is $5 at 30%, 200 bushel corn is $300. Price $6, you get $360. That's 30% of gross on 200 bushels. Big numbers. 55 bushel beans at $12.50 at 40% is $275. If the price is $11.50, it's $253. $13.50, $297. So big, all big numbers. So we're talking big rents as a percent of gross. Okay. So I see gross, percent of gross really small. I see them high. You know, there's a lot of range. So I'm just giving you a 10 year average for the group average. Okay. I'll see them based on profits. This I don't see as much because the farmer has to share all his input costs with you, and they have to divide up the extra. So on the 1,200 farms in the last 15 and 10 years, I'm going to show you shortly, roughly one third of the net goes to the farmer, two thirds of the net goes to the landlord. So the net is what's left over after expenses to go be shared between the farmer and the landlord. So I'm going to use those budgets I showed you earlier. The income was $1,100 on corn. The expenses before rent and labor was $720 an acre. That leaves a net of $380 be shared between the farmer and landlord at 200 bushels at 550. Two thirds of 380 is 253. What's the difference for the farmer? 127, one third, two thirds. On soybeans, my income is 688. My expenses without labor and rent is 343. That leaves me a net of $345. Two thirds of that going to rent would be 230. And one third of that'd be 115 for the farmer, one third, two thirds. It didn't work well in the past because 14 through 19, they were losing money. So um, there wasn't a net to share. So that was 
is lower than the actual cash rent rates. This is where I got those numbers. This is the 1,200 farms. The top line is the average yields from 2007, 2021. But our Morrison and last four rows up here. The $35.67 is the farmer's labor charge each year average. The 141 is the extra the farmer got above his labor charge net income. So a combination of those two numbers is 177. The 125 is the average rent of 1,200 farms. So the total income in 2007 was 312, $302 an acre. That year, the farmer got 59%, landlord got 41%. Next year, it was under $300 income and about 50-50. Next year, it was about 225 and it was one-third, two-thirds. Next year, it was about 450, well, 400, it was over $450. And the farmer got way more. The farmer got way more in, in 11. But then we get 2% for the farmer and then we have five years of losses. And you see how it changed the last couple of years. But here's the 15 year average from 2007, 21. 25% went to the farmer, two thirds or three fourths went to the landlord. 10 year average, 11, 89. Well, you're saying, hey, wait a minute. You said one third, two thirds. Well, I took out those five years when the farmers lose money because who of us can remain in business for five years at a loss? And if we throw those out, these numbers will adjust to that one third, two thirds, closer to on corn. On beans, you don't have to make that adjustment, even though they went a little tighter in the last those same five loss years, they had lower margins. And so it means they only technically lost 22 cents in one year, 2014. But again, it takes those same four rows and the farmer made more there, more less there, less. But here's the 15 year average, 36% to the farmer, 64% to the landlord. Here's what they actually got, 119, 120. Landlord got 191 average over those 15 years. The last 10, here they are. But again, if I take out those little five years, we will be close to that one, five, one fifth, or I'm sorry, one third, two thirds number. Okay. So what is a fair rent for a farmer in good times? And I would argue our prices right now are good times again. So I'm going to take an example where I have that five dollar corn. Those three years we actually had five dollar corn. How the percent of growth changed those three years? In the three years we had five dollar corn and around twelve dollar beans, it was only nineteen percent of corn of growth and thirty percent of growth for beans. Take those same 200 bushels and 55 bushels times the prices times those percentages, and there's the rent on corn and there's the rent on beans. That average is 215. That's a realist number based on history from the same data. Okay. The 10 year average is 30 and 40, and that's 303. So there's two different examples from the same data source looking at it a little differently. So somewhere in there is the right number. Okay. You have to decide. Going a step further, Using those budgets on that I showed you of corn and beans, if my rent's 215, the farmer's making 165 on corn and 130 dollars on beans. That's 140 dollar average compared to rents at 215. They're getting 41 percent of the income. If my rent's 303, the farmer's making 77 dollars on corn and 40 dollars on beans and 60 dollar an acre average. That's 70 percent of the income. So again, if I go one third, two thirds, that 255 might be a good number. But I've taken a step further. And I show you both those examples have an income to be shared between the farmer and landlord based on my budgets for 2023 of $363 an acre. So if I do the two thirds to rent, it actually would come out 242 and the farmer would get 121, be one for two thirds. So that's another example based off of historic numbers for trends. I also online in the handouts, I have a bunch of flexible lease examples. And all these examples, their five-year average is 200 bushels on corn and 55 bushels of beans. And that's my expected yield next fall. My price is at least up in the fall is 550 and 1250, and that's gonna be my harvest price next fall. So the first one's based on yield only. Well, first one's based on, on a, a third of the crop, gross revenue. We'll take a third of the crop on both corn and beans. So 33%. I have a base rent of 150, so that's my spring payment. And my fall payment will be a third of the crop times the price on December 15th, which is gonna be 1250 and 550. There's my total rent on corn, 366. My total rent on beans, about 229. That average is 297.50. Okay, so my fall payment is almost as much as my spring payment, a little bit less, okay? You can do a base rent based on, um, with a bonus. So the base rent, a lot of times people ask me how to use that. For years, I've been using 30% of APH times current prices. But we've high current prices. So at 550 and 1250, our base rent on corn is $330. And our base rent on beans is 203. That average is 266.50. That's above the average rent I told you earlier. So maybe that's a too high of calculation, but that's just what it works out to. 
And then we take a third of a crop again and we get the extra income. So the area is 283,693. You can do them based on yield only. In this example, we have lower base yields, 150 and 40, 150 for corn, 40 for beans. We take our base rent off of those, 30% on those prices, we get $200 base rent, 198.75. Then we get bonuses of our actual yield above those yields. So our 200 bushel of corn next fall and 55 bushel of beans. We have 50 extra bushels of corn at $2 premium, gets us $100 an acre extra rent for corn, and $15 per bushels, 15 bushels at $5 bonus is $75 soybeans. So our total payments for corn would be this, $347.50, and for beans, $225, average is $286.25. And I'm there, probably the most common I see is bushels, and it's price only. So your rent's based on a set amount of bushels, and the only variable is price. So in this example, we're going to use a price of November 1st next fall for the local elevator, cash price. And this is a third of 200 bushel corn is 66, and a third of 55 bushels is 18 bushels. And the price is going to be 550 and 1250. So 550 times 66 gives you 363. 1250 times 18 gives you 225. So you get the average of 294. That's another example. Very simple. Okay. In the handout, I got a couple of lease forms that are just really simple and basic. They're really not really lease form, but there's something that you could do because I, I encourage people to put something in writing. I get more gray hairs in my whiskers every year. And I think every time I get another gray hair, my memory gets shorter. So when I talk about rents in the fall and I actually pay the rents next spring or receive the rents, are they the same number? Do I remember what they were? I don't, so I should write it down somewhere. So on the handout, I've printed off, I have two, two simple things to fill in the blanks. Uh, one for percent of gross and second one for bushels. So fill your name, table acres, and then percent of gross. On the percent of gross, you can use the actual yields, the farm, or you can use your APH, your farm history. And I, there's a benefit to both. Your actual yields, they can jump around, can't they? They can go from 163 to 210 in different years. And if, you're, if you use actual yields time to price, it's a big difference for your rental payments. If I use my five-year yield history, the APH, that's going to adjust slowly. If I have really good yields next year, my rent's going to go up the following year. If I have really poor years, my rent's going to go down, but not as dramatically as I just gave you the example. So you can do either your APH or your actual yields. And I have four different prices here. Just scatter four prices throughout the year, two prices at least. I always tell you, usually the fall price is good for the farmer, the spring price is good for the landlord. So take four dates, average the prices out, and take it times your percent of growth, times your yield or APH times percent of growth. So 10 year average is 30 and 40. And we had $5 corn, it was 19.32. On the page, you'll see a place for you to sign, for them to sign. So landlords and farmers have both had a space to sign dated. So you have a written, please, something that's written writing to go by. This is a line to the middle of that page. The bottom section is for bushels per acre. So this one, you have a set number of bushels and I have four different dates up here. The dates are not the magic issue, it's just spreading them out. Because okay, the price, sometimes harvest is a really good price. Sometimes the harvest is the best price, sometimes the worst. And then put those bushels in. And they can range from 60 to 70 on corn and 70 to 22 on beans. So the bushels, whatever crops they acres they plant those crops, times those bushels, times the average of those 40 to price, you've got your rent. Okay, very simple. Landlords, you can get a first lien in the crop. I do, I'm the mediation representative for extension. I've, I've done, I'm a banker for nine years. I've done media work in extension. And I'm telling you, the notices for that again this month, compared to a year ago and last month, they were down. You see a year ago, they're always down, but in November, they were up a little bit, but normally for the last couple of years, they've always been down. So farmers are getting better. Um, if you've got your cash rent up front and a single payment before the crops and planning, you don't have to worry about this. But if you have a spring and fall payment, you might want to consider doing a lien. You file a UCC filing every year. It's got to be filed within 30 days of the crop starting to grow. So I tell you, if you do it by Memorial Day weekend, you're probably fine in Minnesota. And again, it's up to you. It causes a hassle for the farmer because the checks will be issued in your name as a landlord and also the farmer's name. So I have people calling me from Arizona, Florida, Texas right now with snowbirds to avoid all our nice winter. So the check has to go down there and get signed and come back. So again, you can do it if you want, but it's a hassle for the farmer. Again, once you have it agreed, terms agreed upon for 23, uh, put the lease down writing. Simple ones, or if you want formal lease forms, you go to this website, aglease101.org. There are cash lease forms, flexible lease forms, crop share lease forms, pasture lease forms, and billy lease forms. Write this website down. You can go there and put fill in the blanks, and you've got leases. Okay, very simple place to do 
So I encourage you to write that. It's also on the on your handout if you print it out. Bagleys101.org. Tenants, they're deciding whether they're going to keep or give up landed acres. Number one, they can cover their direct costs in the budget I showed you. Number two, land quality for the rental rates. Those farmers know the difference between the land, especially if they've been farmed for a year, two years. Are these two farms I'm renting? This one over here is pattern tiled. This one over here is not. This one over here has an actual bushel per acre bonus of 20 bushels a year on corn compared to this farm. This farmer says, or landlord says, I want the same rent my neighbor does. They deserve the same rent. 20 bushels more corn every year is a lot of difference, isn't it? At $5, it's $100 an acre difference in their income. So they, the farmers know the difference. They have to decide and try to communicate that with the landlords. Again, the financial positions of the farmers, they started making money again in 19, they made more in 20, made more in 21, and the USDA is saying record income in 22. So they're getting stronger financially. Well, there's still a few farms that are in trouble, so you, you still might consider your UCC. I'm not saying you shouldn't, and you might look for other ways to generate money. Landlords, looking for the ability to cover your costs, your financial needs, and the number two is strict relationship. You know, the snow weather now, it's really important. Sometimes the farmer is the only one that's close to your mom and dad or your grandma and grandpa. The kids have all moved away. Um, so they're really important to have that good relationship. They go over and check on mom and dad or grandma and grandpa. They'll clean their yard out. They'll do a lot of things for them. So I had a landlord at my work in Wilmer on Monday and she said, he does that for me. He even pays my taxes for me on my land. So that's a really good relationship. My family farmed in South Dakota. My dad's side is the same farmer for 50 years. My mom's side is the same farmer for 20, 40 years. So long-term good relationships. Number three, I get this question more and more from landlords. We're getting so many generations moved from the actual farmers. Um, I'm currently doing a farm transfer and state planning workshop online. I've mean, done two sessions. I'm going to do two more. So you can sign up for those on the extension website as well. But <clears throat> I did a workshop in uh, Iowa a few, quite a few years ago and there was a gentleman from Missouri. There were, and his family farm was in Illinois. He was one of 171 landowners for the farm. It's gone through that many generations of ownership. 171 people own one, part, one farm. So, and we're getting to that point in Minnesota where we have five generations removed from the farming area. So I have a lot of people saying they want to plant cover crops. They can, I can do whatever you want for requirements. I have some people saying they don't want any corn planted because it's bad for the, the Gulf of Mexico. The dead zone gets growing from the pollution. And the cover crops are good for erosion. So you can do that, but you have to think about how many people, corn's the number one crop you plant in Minnesota. So if you say they can't plant corn, you're, thinking, you're gonna limit who wants to take rent your land. So again, there's some things to think about there. Maybe you wanna consider a flexible lease option. Those are things to think about. You wanna win for both parties in negotiations. Wanna separate the people from the problem. I get a lot of landlords say that darn farmer, he's got a new pickup every year. I don't have a new pickup. Or that darn farmer goes to Hawaii every winter. I don't go to Hawaii every winter. Well, we're not talking about their lifestyle. We're talking about land rent. We're not talking who you're renting from, don't make a past complex. Do a checklist. What do you want? What do they want? I'll give you some resources here today. You print the handout, you have more. Online, you have more. Here's a very simple flexible lease. Are you wanting a certain margin? So here's my margin example. So I want $200 an acre in my pocket every year on my total acres. That's the margin. The flexible part is you pay the taxes. So I get my tax statement from the county. So I'm going to make a copy of that, give it to the farmer. He's going to give me a check for those taxes plus $200 per acre. There's my rent. It's a flexible agreement. Okay. Some farmers will pay that right in the courthouse, but I'm more control freak. I want them to pay me the rent and the taxes so I make sure they're paid on time. I've seen a 40-year lease out there. You can take long-term leases. Um, Southeast Minnesota, they put on Lyme. I see a lot of that uh, being done too, as far as uh, a, there's a seven-year residual for that. So I see leases where they actually have a, a Pay off the line if I lose the land in any of those seven years. I see people putting on, want to put alfalfa on, they want a three year lease. Some farmers have tiling equipment, they want a multiple return lease for that. Um, my dad was a lender, egg lender for 40 years, and he did mark or management afterwards. He did a 25 year flexible lease where the price and yields were the variables. So it worked out, didn't have to change it. And we used to think in terms of $250 was a big number to cost shop. Well, it's not so big anymore. We want to invent an option mutual gain for both parties. We want to create a solution that meets the interests of maybe use a flexible lease, maybe add clause to that lease agreement, like cover crops, uh, whatever other things you want them to do. Um, maybe you want them to have the, give them pride their yields to you every year, different things like that. Maybe use that margin model I just described. Maybe set up a long-term agreement. What's right for you is up to you to figure out. 
I want to use objective criteria. I give us resources, the Ag Service, the FinBin data from farmers' records. I haven't talked so much about coffee shop rates. Oftentimes you hear this big number, but there's a reason behind that big number. So that comes with the coffee shop. Your preparation is important in negotiations, and you're doing that by listening to this workshop. You've got resources in your hand, resources online. Um, I encourage you to use them by preparing an engagement review and encourage your partner to do the same thing. Um, I can send you a, a link uh, for the recording. We'll do that. So you can pass it along too if they want to listen to this recording. Negotiating skills are important. We want to win with both parties. If you print it off, these are the websites I talked about today. First one's our extension. So the really website stops at you know, you know man, and then you manage in a farm and you'll get to us. And then the second one's FinBin data. It's a great place. Ag Civic Service, I have rental rates, land values, uh, yields, that land economics is a great place to look at the sale prices of different properties and lease, Ag Lease 101 and shows you bank lease forms fill in the blanks. And here's the handout again. Write that down right there. That's where you can find the handout online. Whoops. Took my wrong button. Sorry. That Z link. So I'll give you a second to write that down. So if you want to print the handout out afterwards, there's the, the Z link to so write that down quick. It's just HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash Z dot U M N dot E D U forward slash 2022 land rent handout. The reason why it says 22 because this is my 22 rotations, my 30th talk, but most of them were in 2022. Right. All right, everybody got it? Give me a little longer. Then I'm, I also tell you, I do a, a book called The Farm Resource Guide. Last year, 141 pages. I have lease forms in there. You have to fill in the blanks and print it out or copy it. I have custom rates. I have billing rates, rental rates. Um, I have all, a lot of slides we have in here. I have in there. So if you want to copy, paper cost. Paper copies that 141 pages, $31. That includes your sales tax and postage. If you want a CD, $29 does the same thing. If you want an email version, it's $25 plus sales tax for every live. Okay. It's going to be available in January 23. I'm still working on it. Um, I've been on the road a lot lately, still going strong. So probably late next week, I'll get it done. If you want a copy, you send me an email to that B A U X X, my email address, or leave a message in my landline. I need your name your address, your phone number, and your email if you, if you leave me a phone message, and the university will bill you by email, and I'll send you whatever version you want. So again, it's real simple to do, or you can go online and you can find a, a link to it online to order as well. So, what direction rents go next year? They stay the same? Should they go up? Should they go down? That number you wrote in, on the first question I asked you, what about rents for 2023? What was that for you? Was it going up? Was it staying the same? Was it going down? I know of leases for all three right now. I can, I've been doing this so many talks, so many examples. I have some that stay the same because the input costs are going up. I have some that are going up dramatically because they haven't gone up very much the last couple of years because the price improved. And I have I know one example is going down. Not too many are going down. Okay. So I gave you lots of examples today. They range from 211 to 320. That's a big range, isn't it? So you have to figure out what you think is a fair rent and do some good negotiating and hoping to come up with the right answer for you. I still have more, this, this is my second day of Zoom meetings. Every Thursday for the, through February 9th, I'm gonna do two a day. So next week I'll do Mankato, Hutchinson, Worthington, and Farmington, just like this, just talking about those areas. So if you know somebody else who might wanna attend those areas, just send them to our website and sign up like you did, okay? So thanks for joining us today. I take any questions. Um, again, because you're all mic'd up, I think you can just take your mics off mute if you'd like to, or else you can put a question in the chat box. I will stay in, online here for a while to answer any questions. Um, so I see one in the chat already. Um, question about email is yes, you can email us. Um, that's, I, I put that email in the first line. It's on the handout in the first page of the handout when you get the information. And it shows my email address, my phone number. I get three questions a year round on rent. So feel free to call me or leave me a, uh, send me an email. I'll get back to you when I can, okay? Any other questions? <laughs>